Hello and welcome to this video on understanding the Incarnation, the Word became flesh. The doctrine of the Incarnation is one of the most profound and mysterious teachings of Christianity, and it has significant implications for our faith. In this video, we'll be diving into what it means for the Word to become flesh and what this means for us as believers. Don't forget to subscribe and like before we begin. Then read the Bible John 1 1 18. The first verse of John reminds me of the first verse of Genesis. Genesis 1 describes God's creation and its contents, whereas John 1 1 introduces a person who was present when it was created. The Bible translated as the word, but the word that John actually used was logos. Is there a reason why John used the term Logos instead of Jesus? In Greek philosophy, Logos played an important role. Those who think rationally and express their thoughts with rational words were known as Logos. Hellas believed that humans were the core of Logos, the reason for the universe. Therefore, I thought humans could learn about space and human knowledge. As a result, I understood that learning this knowledge is salvation. John says that the Logos they think are Jesus and that he is the way of salvation and the means of salvation. The concept of Logos was not limited to Greek culture. Although Jewish society at the time of Jesus became very hella over hundreds of years, the Bible was the center of Jewish thinking. According to the Bible, God created the world with His words. Law and wisdom were considered by the Jews to embody the Word. The Old Testament emphasizes law and wisdom for this reason. John tells those who have this idea that Jesus is the Word. I claim that the Logos was with God in the act of creation. The world was created through Him and nothing was made without Him, not because we were together but because He made everything through Him. A new creation is created when the light shines in the dark and winds. In John's Gospel, we live as creatures of new creation in the world that Jesus has created with victory. The Apostle John emphasizes and discusses the fact that John the Baptist is not light. The Jews at the time believed that John the Baptist might be the Messiah, according to Luke. People seem to have thought more about John the Baptist than necessary even when John the Apostle lived. From verse 9 to verse 11, John returns to the story of the Lord, who is light. Throughout the story, he portrays a world that rejects the true light, Logos. The light of Jesus shines on the world. However, people rejected Jesus, the light of life. Neither Jesus' world nor his possessions, the people, knew him and did not welcome him. In spite of the fact that socializing with him is the purpose of new creation, the world rejects him. Throughout chapters 2 to 12, we see how the Lord, the light, is ostracized by the people. In verse 12, John talks about people who will have a positive response, as opposed to those who reject the Lord, the light. As soon as one acknowledges that Jesus is the Logos and has come to the light of new creation, one is given the power to become a child of God. In John's explanation, we become children of God when we become new creatures of creation. Likewise, Paul describes our salvation as being adopted as children of God as being creatures of new creation. Christianity talks about this blessing. Living a long and prosperous life is not the blessing of true salvation. Being part of God's family is what it means. In verse 13, John refers to three conditions unrelated to the privilege of being a child of God. 
In the first place, blood refers to Jewish blood. Secondly, the will of the flesh refers to natural birth. Lastly, the will of the man refers to the will of the Father. According to John, he is not a child of God based on his blood, natural birth, or parents' will. A system of privileged people in the world is limited according to certain standards under these conditions. Being a member of God's family is not a privilege reserved for specific loyalty. According to John, this privilege is granted by faith. The privilege of becoming a member of God's family is open to all those who accept Jesus with faith. According to verse 14, God created us to be part of His family by doing one thing. Due to human sin and vulnerability, the man-made tent and temple could not last. The original Greek text reads God became a body and set up a tent among us. So Logos personally visited humans in his body and built a perfect temple that could never be destroyed. The holy body is what it means. When the Israelites played tent or completed the temple, Jehovah's glory would often appear. John said he saw God's glory in the temple when he saw the Lord strike the tent among us. In verse 16, John says it is grace to associate with God within the tent of the Lord. What is beautiful is the expression of grace over grace. In this phrase, grace overflows and is poured over grace. The phrase can be translated into a grace instead of grace if you translate it according to John's intention. How does grace apply to grace? Through Moses, God gave the law to the people of the first covenant. It is described as grace in the Old Testament. However, John talks about another grace that replaces it. It is said that grace comes through Jesus Christ instead of the first grace. The explanation of paragraph 16 and 17 is as follows. The holy body of Jesus, that is, the event in which the Logos hit the tent, completes grace. The shadow grace is past, and the true grace has come to the first promised people in the Old Testament. The law is also God's grace. However, it is only a shadow, not a substance. The good news is that there's someone who can tell us what he's like when it comes to his father. The law was the only way to know who God was in the first world. As I saw the shadow of the law, I knew God's character and had to associate with him. Now you can see what God is like when you look at Jesus, the Logos. Now, in the world of new creation, we can have a close relationship with God through Jesus. So far, we have looked at John 1 1 18. In conclusion, the doctrine of the Incarnation is a profound and powerful teaching that has significant implications for our faith. Through the Word becoming flesh, we are able to experience the love and grace of God in a personal way, understand the nature of God, and learn about the value of humanity. Thank you for watching, and may God bless you as you continue to grow in your understanding of this crucial doctrine.